Deuteronomy 1.3. In the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month, by the way, we're starting a new series today called Legacy Lives Here. In the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in commandment to them. Now listen to this because we need to understand that God is still speaking to his people. And here in the 40th year, God begins to speak. And I'm telling you, there's always a time, there will be a time when God will speak to move his people into new directions. Go down with me now to the sixth verse, Deuteronomy 1, 6. And the Lord our God said to us in Horeb, this is the mountain of God. <clears throat> Listen to this. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. How many of you, you felt like you've been in the same place for a long time and now it's time for something new? Listen, I'm not talking about your location, your physical location. I'm talking about where you are in life. Where you've been mentally, where you've been emotionally. How many of you know God has greater for your life? <laughs> greater than I have seen, greater than ear has heard. <clears throat> And for us to be able to go into these new places, then we have to be willing to move and get out of where we've been for so long. How many of you are willing to go where the Lord is instructing you to go? <laughs> so he said, you've stayed long enough at this mountain. How many of you feel like maybe you've stayed long enough where you've been in life? It's time for change. It's time to go to a new glory. Now watch. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the lowland and in the Degeb and by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. This is the land that God has promised them. Watch this. See, everybody say that word see. See that I have set the land before you. That's important. See that I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. The Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them and to their offspring after them. Now. Let me just take a little side step here because this intrigues me when I see this. He said, the land that I said I would give to them. Now they're dead. They're gone. How many of you know they've been dead for hundreds of years? But he said, when you go in, they're going to get the inheritance I promised them. Ah! There are things that God has promised to former generations that as we move in what God has said to them, not only do we get it, but they get it too. They're not complete without us. We are not complete without them. Oh, this is powerful. So listen to this. He says, there's several things I want you to see. Number one, he says, you've stayed long enough at this mountain. What does that mean? That means that we need to discern when we have outlived our stay. To every season, everybody hear this, Ecclesiastes 3. To, every, to every, every season, there is a time, there's a purpose under the heaven. To everything, let me say it right. To everything, there's a season. <clears throat> and a time for every purpose to be accomplished under the heaven. For everything, there's a time and there's a season. So there's a season to be where you are, but then there's a season where you need to move somewhere different, somewhere new. Now, again, I'm not talking about a lot of people here that, and they, yeah, yeah, you know, I need, to, I need to go to Alabama and live. Nobody's saying that. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm kidding. We think, but here's the thing. It's not about changing location because you're, you, you are you wherever you go. A lot of people think, you know, if I can just change this, then that'll change everything. But the thing is, it's not about changing the place. It's about changing the way you see the place. So when I'm talking to you about change, I'm talking to you about seeing things in a different way and a shift in your thinking that will let you move somewhere you've never been before. We have to learn and we have to grow. There's a time to be at the mountain, but then there's a time to move. 
Everything that God does, he does with purpose. How many of you know that everything you've walked through in life, whether it's been good, whether you call it, let me say it this way, whether you call it good, whether you call it bad, whether you call it whatever, everything you've walked through in life has brought you to this moment. And hopefully everything that you've gone through, you've learned something in the midst of it. As a matter of fact, I believe that we're supposed to learn and grow as we walk through different things in life. And if we'll lean into the spirit, we'll always get the good because he works all things together for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to his purpose. Somebody say, God's working it all for my good. So we have to discern. When is it time for a shift? When is it a time for a change? When is it time to move? And then he said, turn and take your journey and go. This word turn, I mean, you know, we're full turn church. Somebody say full turn church. This word turn talks about moving in a new direction. Turn, change your direction. Change your direction and begin to move the direction I'm calling you to go in. How many of you know we need to begin to turn and move in the direction of God? So to move from where I am to where he wants me to be, I have to begin to move in the direction that he's calling me to move and I have to be willing to turn. Everybody say that word turn. In other words, if I keep moving in the same direction, I'm going to have the same results. But if I'll be willing to turn at the word of God, there's a passage in Scripture in the Old Testament where he says, turn at my reproof. If we'll listen to the Lord, he'll tell us when to stay and when to go. Are you hearing me? He'll, he'll tell us when, okay, now wait, be still, and know that I'm God. And then he'll tell us, now, go. But going means I've got to be willing to move in the direction that God wants me to move in. Everybody say that word move and turn. So turn denotes a change in direction and mindset. Everybody say that word mindset. So what is a mindset? A mindset is what your mind is set on. Whatever you're constantly thinking about is what your mind is set upon and it becomes your mind set. And so to change my direction, I have to change my mind. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. Everybody hear that again. If you can change your mind, if you can allow the Lord to transform your thinking by his spirit, he'll, tra he'll transform you and take you from where you are to the next place. Now follow me. I'm laying a foundation. Everybody hear what I'm saying to you today. I've got to change my mindset. Maybe my mind has been set on this, but now I need to turn and see something new. See something in a different way. How many of you, you've ever looked at something that you've seen a lot of time, but, times, but this time when you observed it, you saw something new in it? How many of you, you've read a scripture or a passage of scripture before and all of a sudden the spirit illuminated something to you and you said, oh, I've never seen that like that before. Do you know why that is? Because the word of God is living and active and alive and he calls us from depth to depth. He calls us from glory to glory. So we're walking in a glory <laughs> the mountain of Horeb has a glory. Ah, it, it, it's the mountain of God. It's where they've heard the voice of God, where God has spoken to Moses. But now he's saying it's time to move to a greater glory. So hear that. Somebody say a greater glory. Have you ever thought that maybe God is wanting to take this people and his church to a greater glory, which means there's going to have to be a shifting in the way we see things. So then what's the next word he sees? He says, you stayed long enough, turn and go in the, and take your journey and go. It's a journey. Somebody say this walk with God is a journey. It's a journey. It's a walk with God. And then he says, see, see that the land is before you. What I want you to hear from this today is that we have to see that God has a future. 
There's a future that God has for his people. There's a future that he's bringing us to. We have a destiny and a destination in Jesus Christ, which means none of us are meant to stay where we are currently in life. We're, go, we're to grow and go new places in the way we see in our understanding and our knowledge and wisdom. We are to go into new territory. Right? Okay, so he says, see, I've set the land before you. Seeing is sight. Seeing brings clarity. Remember when the disciples were saying to Jesus, Jesus, what, what's going on? Why are you saying these things to the Pharisees? And he said, leave them alone. They are blind guides. And then he said, and if the blind will lead the blind, they'll both or all wind up in the ditch. So seeing means that I have clarity, that there's a vision and a revelation that comes from God that paints a picture of the future and where he's taking us. If I can't see it, I can't be it. If I can't see it, I can't obtain it. If I can't see it, I can't get to it. If you don't know it's, it exists, you don't even know what to be looking for. Is everybody hearing me? But when his word comes, his word comes to paint pictures on the canvas of our heart and mind so that we can see what we've not yet seen. So he says, see, there's a land before you. There's greater before you. How many of you are ready to see greater? And then he says, go and take possession of the land. The land that I swore to your fathers. Now this is important. Somebody say, legacy lives here. What that means is that the story didn't start with us. We're a part of an ongoing story. God is a God who works generationally. I am here today because of those who cut the path before me. You are here today because those who went before you cut the path. There, there were a people who went before us who were praying. There, there were a people who went before us that now are a part of the great cloud of witnesses that believed. They stood upon the word of God. The church didn't just arrive here. We got here because there was a people who came before us who believed and even laid down their lives so that we can be here today. So God reminds Moses, this is a promise I gave your fathers. It started a long time ago, and you are a continuation of the work that started with them. You couldn't do it without them, and they can't do it without you. Today, I would not be standing here if it wasn't for my grandfather and my grandmother who were called out of Arizona where they were at the time and they were called to start a church. They were praying and they were fasting and the Lord spoke to them and said, Atlanta, Georgia. And they followed the voice of the Lord that brought them to this place. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my parents and their faith the, 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 that raised me in an atmosphere where I could believe and where I could dream. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have voices of, and leaders in my life who didn't help me and encourage me and help me to see what I could not see in myself. What we need to understand is this. We need one another and we need to value what has gone before us because we're still a part and a continuation of that work. My grandfather told me before he died, he said this to me. He said, son, he said, when I watch what you're doing in ministry, he was now up in his 90s. He said, it's just like I'm doing it. This is what he told me. He, he couldn't get around as well as he used to. He was still preaching. He preached up until the week before he passed away. But he would sit behind the table because he could no longer stand. But he told me, he said, son, whenever I see you doing what you're doing and building the church, he said, it's me. It's just like I'm doing it. And this is what he said, because you're bone of my bone and you're blood of my blood. Do you get that? We're all a part of something greater than ourselves. We are members of the body of Christ. 
We are members of one another. This is not something that just came to be. This is something that started ages ago and we're a part of this story. And there's still a future. There's somewhere that God is calling for us to go. And so hear this. We are a church. This church. We are a church with a past. We're a church that has a present. And we're a church that has a future. Somebody say, I have a past. I've got a present. And I've got a future. And the God who did it before. Come on. The God who did it before can do it now, and if he can do it then, and he can do it now, then he can do it again in my future. Why? He's the God who was and the God who is and the God who is to come. What God started, he will finish. What he started, he will finish. He will bring it to completion. So let's talk about this word legacy. Is everybody in the room with me today? Let's talk about this word legacy. Legacy, these are some of the thoughts that that came out. But understand, legacy, the definition of legacy is is something that has a long-lasting impact. It has a long-lasting, everybody say that word, lasting. has a long-lasting impact. Here's some thoughts that the Lord gave me on this. Legacy has to do with our ability to continue to build upon what was started in the past. Our ability to build upon what was started in the past. Our ability to take the work that someone has put in our hands, entrusted us with, and make it even greater. How many of you know that every generation should be greater than the generation that came before it? Why? Because this generation is to instruct the next generation. And if this generation instructs the next generation and we receive the wisdom that this generation took years to receive and we, oh, we get to start with a wisdom that we didn't get on our own, but it was passed down. It was given to us. Listen, there's so much out there that people in our history and in church history, that people, they, they believed and they sought the Lord and, and they got before the Lord and they fasted and they prayed and they lived devoted lives and the Lord revealed things to them. For us to act like that doesn't exist and try to get things on our own would be stupid. Why? There's no reason to recreate a will. Just continue to build the car. Does anybody hear that? And so every generation should get greater. God does things line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God is a God who is growing us. He's taking us somewhere. And every generation should be stronger because of the generation that came before it. The problem is when we say that the future is not important. The problem is when we leave our children to their their own demise and let them go their own way and we don't instruct them in the ways of the Lord or impart the wisdom that God has given us. The Bible says that Jacob came to the end of his life and Jacob leaned on the edge of his staff. Now, I don't have time to preach this, but if you understand anything about the staff, they would carve in their staff they would carve significant moments in their life. So he's come to the end of his life and everything on that staff is there before him and his family. All that God has done in their family, all that God has brought them to, now he's come to the end and he leans on the edge of his staff. And he reaches out his hands and he begins to pray over the next generation. He begins to prophesy over the children. He begins to prophesy over their future. This is important because the words that we hear and believe will will cause us to move in a direction. And if we don't believe in the future, then who will? If we don't believe in our children, then who will? And so, yeah, our kids get crazy at times. Yes, our kids have this thing and that thing. They become teenagers and God help us. 
But we should never stop imparting to them and believing and praying for them and still instructing them. And even as they're learning and walking through things and we have to walk through it with them and watch them do things knowing where they're headed at times. We have to be there to help them pick up the pieces because they need us. They cannot be perfect without us and we cannot be perfect without them. So hear this. Legacy. Legacy and leaving a legacy means that we make sure we prepare the generation coming up under us to continue the work and take it higher. Our ceiling should be their floor. Let me say it again. Our ceiling, as far as we can go, should be the floor they begin to stand upon and build. Leaving a legacy means that we are able to discern, to discern when it's time to trust others with the dreams that are in our heart and help them to run with the vision into greater places than we ever could imagine that they could go. Legacy is not about forgetting those who've gone before us, but rather remembering them often, celebrating their achievements, understanding their importance and their role and getting us to where we are today. Legacy is about all of the generations. All of the generations. Listen, we got a lot of different generations seated here today. But legacy means that all the generations are working together for a common purpose. That's why the, the Apostle Paul instructed those of you who are older men, treat the younger men like they're your sons. Those of you who are older women, Treat the younger women like they're your daughter. See, we're a family. It's all the generations working together. We're in this together. There's wisdom that can be passed down. There, there, it, one generation can help the other to accomplish all that God has purposed. So when God speaks to Moses and he says, you've stayed here long enough, this is not just one or two or three or four people moving. This is going to be millions of people that are going to move with the word of God. This is people of different ages that are going to move together at the word of God. How many of you know we've been called to do this together? doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your age is. We've been called to do this together, and every person is important, and every person is vital. Amen. So watch this, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all. With unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. Look into Jesus. Beholding the glory of the Lord, the light of God that we see in Christ. Beholding the glory of the Lord. We are all being transformed. We are a people who are being transformed. We are a people that are being changed. We are a people who are becoming something greater than we are right now. We are being transformed into the same image. The image of what? The glory. The image of what? Jesus. We are being changed into the image. Watch this. From one degree of glory to another. So God wants to take us from one degree of glory to the next, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. Somebody say from glory to glory. So God wants to take us generationally. He wants to take us from glory to glory. In our day-to-day -day lives, he wants to take us from glory to glory. God is wanting to take us from glory to glory so that we can grow up in him and grow into his image and grow into his likeness. That is a corporate thing. God wants his church to look like him. And we're growing up into that image. That means that we are in a process of daily transformation as our mind is being renewed and our minds are being changed. As we look at Jesus, we become more and more like Jesus. That's why it's important to study the word of God. That's why it's important to spend time in the presence of God. Because the more I behold him, the more I become like him. If you want to know where you're going, you have to look to the one who created you. Is anybody here? If you want to know who you are, then you have to look to the one who created you. Because he's the one who designed you. He's the one who can speak to your purpose. He's the one who can help you see all that he has for your life and where he's taking you. So from glory to glory, he's 
growing us from one degree, degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is a work of the Spirit. That the Spirit of God is transforming us. The Spirit of God is changing us. How many of you like that word change? That's a tough word. Why is that? Because change is difficult to walk through at times. It's hard to, to change when you're used to something being a certain way. The hardest thing for some people to do is change. The hardest thing, you know, you've heard the old adage that it's hard to, tre- to, to teach an old dog new tricks. You ever heard that? Listen, when we get stuck in a pattern or way of doing things and we get fully persuaded that that's the only way, we can never go somewhere new. When God wants to use this to teach us something that will take us higher. Not to keep us where we are. Ah, (laughs) The, The greatest opponent to the new move is the old move. Why? Because everybody wants to go back. I want to go back to the way it was. I want to go back to the old. I want to go back to the good old days. I want to go back to to the way it was 10 years ago. I I want to go back to the way it was 20 years ago. You know, it was really cool back in the 80s. Things were different then. We got society saying, man, if I could just go back to, if we could go back to the way it was in the 50s. It wasn't all that good. It all depends what, what person you might have been as to whether that was a good time to live or not. Are you hearing me? There was a lot of social change and things that needed to take place in the 50s, but no, we want to go back and live there. Well, that depends who you are. Because we all have a mindset of the way things were and, and it was good then, but was it really good? Or is God really taking us somewhere that's greater than I have seen, greater than ear has heard, greater than what's entered into our heart? And we have to be willing to release what was to walk into what will be. We have to be willing to change. Some, sometimes that means a letting go of things that we're used to. But those things that we're used to are keeping us where we are. I, I'm watching this guy on uh, social media. I know him. He, he started the gym uh, that's become a franchise now, Twisted Cycle, that is where I go and where I work out. And so I watch some of the stuff that he posts. He's one of the owners. And he's right now, he, he's posting these pictures where he, man, he's like muscled up. And you can see like every muscle in his body. And I said, man, he's almost to where I am. <laughs> I mean, he is what we call ripped. Like he looks good. But every time he posts, he's, he's going through a process. So the process started with, okay, I, at this point in the journey, I'm allowing this many calories. And I'm doing this as exercise. And then when he needed to go deeper, he changed his calorie intake. And he changed some of his workout regimen. And then, now he's gotten to where he is now. Now he says, I'm about to hit my last thing before this competition where I'm going to, to cut out all carbs there's a process but the thing is if you stay at the 2000 calorie a day diet that's what you'll you'll be i'm not talking about your physical body hear what i'm saying if you want the greater you have to be willing to change when it's time to change when the lord says you've been at this mountain long enough then you have to say you know what I've been here long enough. It's time for something new. And so change isn't easy. It isn't comfortable. It isn't popular. However, change is inevitable. It will happen. It happens to us all. We need to learn and embrace change. Embrace change. I mean, I could throw out so many examples of things that that have changed in the way we do things and technology And different technologies that when they were new, people fought them so hard. But now they've become a great benefit. We wouldn't even know how to live without them. 
But we're being changed into his image. It's a work of the spirit. It's a work that's going on on the inside of us. It's an inside job. It's a work from the inside out. So listen to this. Hear this, because I'm coming to the heartbeat of this message today. I've learned in my life that there's something called necessary endings. There are necessary endings. Because in God, when one thing is ending, a new thing is beginning. We see this in nature. We see this in the butterfly. All that is the caterpillar goes into the cocoon. And as it goes into the cocoon, it is being changed. All that is the caterpillar is is being broken down so that it can be built back up into something that is a new creature. But that new creature comes out of the caterpillar. And in life, as we go through necessary endings in our life, how many of you have experienced necessary endings in your life? I mean, there are things that had to end. If it didn't end, you couldn't have, you couldn't end up where you are right now. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, how many of you graduated high school? Are you glad that it came to an end? Why did it come to an end? It had to come to an end. There had to be a graduation day. So that you could step into another level of living in life and doing what you were created and designed to do. You couldn't stay there. You couldn't stay in kindergarten. Why is everybody so quiet in here? You couldn't stay in kindergarten. There there comes a, a time. I mean, you can't be 12 years old in kindergarten. It doesn't work. There comes a time where you've got to move to another level. And there comes a time where you've got to be willing to take the next step. How many of you know you can't go higher if you won't climb higher? You won't take the next step. And so this is the journey that God has us on. Necessary endings bring about new beginnings. See, with God, it's not the, it's not the fi- final step. It brings you to the next step. I've got to let go of this step to get up on this one. That one must end so that this one can begin. Is everybody here? And in life, you'll experience that. You'll experience that in your life. You'll experience it in relationships. You'll experience it in many different ways. It's it's a process of letting go so that you can take hold. Let go so that you can take hold. Some of the greatest moments in my life have come when I let go of something that needed to, to exit my life so that God could really do the thing he wanted to do. Some of the greatest times in my life. But I had to be willing to do what was difficult. How many of you know if you'll do the difficult, God will do the impossible? If you'll do the difficult, God will do the impossible. You have to take a step of faith with God. So hear this. Necessary necessary endings often feel like disintegration. How many of you have ever gone through those times in your life where you're like, what's going on, God? It feels like disintegration. It feels like a falling apart. It, it feels like a coming undone. It feels that way. Everybody hear what I'm saying to you? It feels that way because that is what death is. <laughs> but in Christ, how many of you know he died? I don't know if y'all ready. He died. He was buried, and he rose again. As Christians, we have to learn how to practice death, burial, and resurrection. And your life is a process of dying for new things to come forth. You practice death, you practice resurrection. And dying doesn't feel good. Dying feels like suffering. Are you with me? Dying feels like, what is going on, God? (laughs) What's happening here, God? But if you'll go through the death process and you'll suffer with him, if you'll go through the dying, all of a sudden a new life will come when God resurrects you into new things, into greater things than you've ever been before. Because that dying a lot of times is dying to ourself and dying to our old nature and dying to our, our old way of thinking because until that thinking is done away with, 
that I can't embrace the new thing that is before me. So old things must die so that new things can live. One thing can only go so far. You've stayed at this mountain long enough so that a new thing can be accomplished, so that a new thing can be done. One thing must end for a new thing to begin. How many of you are ready to die so that you might live? Are you with me? So you cannot have a new beginning holding on to old ideas. Why? Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I want to close with this. It's time for an upgrade. How many of you, you're ready for an upgrade? Anybody got an iPhone? iPhone? Thank you. Thank you. This is, by the way, my sister-in-law and my niece and nephew and my niece's boyfriend are in town. Would you just welcome them today? This right here, what is it? It's an iPhone. What kind of iPhone is it? Do you know? iPhone 14. How many of you know that the iPhone didn't start at 14? As a matter of fact, there were phones before iPhones. How many of you remember landlines? How many of you remember that when you needed to make a phone call, you had to go to that place in your house where the phone was plugged into the wall? Some of you younger people in here are saying, what? Such a thing existed? As a matter of fact, way, 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 way back in the day. I mean, way, way back in the day. Yeah, you had to do this with your phones. You had to pull a little thing off, put it to your ear while you're talking into this thing. And the glory of the phone... The glory of the invention of the phone meant that I can be here and talk to someone who's not in the same room with me. And for the people of that day and that era and that age, that had to be amazing. Are you kidding me? I talk into this thing. I can hear somebody with this. I can talk into this and I'm talking to somebody down the street. That's amazing. But now... This thing can go with me everywhere I go. Not only can I talk to someone in other cities and other countries, but not only can I talk to them, if I want to, I can see them. There was a glory of the Alexander Graham Bell phone. It had a glory. But that glory had to shift. That glory had to change. When we get to things like the iPhones, they call them the next generation of the iPhone. Why is it called the next generation? It's called the next generation because it's capabilities. Are greater, even if it's ever so slightly, what it can do is greater than the former generation. But this generation could never have been if it wasn't for Alexander Graham Bell. In our life, we're on this kind of journey. Do you want to continue with the Alexander Graham Bell phone? Or do you want to upgrade? There comes a time where technology has to change. And I know we're not robots. I know we're not computers. We're human beings. But in Christ, we are a new creation. We're learning who we are in him. And his spirit takes us from glory to glory to glory. 
His spirit over the past 2,000, since he poured out his spirit in Acts 2, he's been taking the church from place to place in him, growing in him, learning in him. And there are times that we have to look back so that we can understand, again, where we're going. We lose sight of where we're going because we forget what went before us. But when we look at it all, we can remember that's what what happened. That's what God did. That's how he did it. And look at where we are now because we're a people who has a past and a present and a future. And God is taking us somewhere. Full turn, there's a word for us today and I need you to hear it as your pastor. Where we have been, we can no longer stay. God is taking this church and he's taking this people to a place where we can experience a spiritual upgrade. God wants to upgrade this people in many different ways. He wants to get us to a place where we can thrive, where we can grow, where we can flourish, and where we can truly accomplish the work that he's purposed for us to do. Now everybody hear me. There was a time that the children of Israel needed to be in Egypt. They had to be. They had to be. God even told Abraham, this is what's going to happen. Egypt for a time was the place that saved them and fed them. Are you with me? And it was the place where they really could become a people and a nation. But there came a time where Egypt no longer could contain them and hold them And it was no longer the place where they could really become the people of God. So God raises up Moses and he takes them out of Egypt and he takes them into the wilderness. But the wilderness is not their forever place. The wilderness is the time of testing and proving where he's going to get everything that was bad and poor information out of them. As he gets, he brought them out of Egypt, he's going to get Egypt out of them. And everything that was a hindrance has to die in the wilderness. And then he raises up Joshua and the children of that former generation to rise up and to go and to take possession. There's a time for Egypt. There's a time for the wilderness. There's a time for the promised land. This church started in a little community center Every Wednesday night, I was meeting with a group of people, mainly teenagers, trying to get people and strength in that place where we could start a church. We moved from that community center from four weeks, six weeks, wherever we are, and we moved into a warehouse that we converted into a church. God calls us to grow there to where we purchased that building. We launched out, we started Hiram, we had two locations. The Lord spoke to us to buy property and to build. There's a time for Yorkville. There's a time for Hiram. And there's a time for where God's taking us. We can't get stuck here. We can't get stuck where we are. We can't say, isn't this good enough? No, we have to say there comes a time where we can't stay at the mountain any longer. There's a time where God has spoken greater for us as a people and for us as a church body. Today is the day that I say to you as a Moses, that I say to you as a Joshua, not to compare myself with those guys, but to say I stand as your leader and I say to you, it's time that we arise. And it's time that we hear the word of the Lord. And it's time that we begin to go in the direction of God so that we can occupy and take hold of that which God has promised, that which is before us. It's going to take a greater people. And I'm not talking about greater than you. I'm talking about a greater work in all of us that takes us to a place where we become a greater people that are ready to apprehend and lay hold to what God has promised. I think about what God started years ago with my grandfather and grandmother. Their legacy lives. Their legacy lives. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And it lives on in me and it lives on in others that are saying, we will continue to do what God has said. 
How many of you in here today will say, you know what, we're a part of a story that's still unfolding and we're not done. God's not done with me. He's not done with you. He's not done with with us where we are. And God is doing a greater work to take us into a greater place. Would you stand to your feet?